Hello Ebenezer family and hello Facebook family. Um, this is Nash coming to you from the church and just going to do a quick devotional thought here and just a time to help us to really focus on the Lord and focus on our relationship with him. And again, one of the recommendations I have been making and I will continue to make is those of you who find yourselves at home with all kinds of spare time, I can think of a great way to use some of that spare time and that's to really invest in the most important relationship you have and that's with Jesus Christ. So I'm going to be doing these little devotional thoughts every month, every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday about this time. So come back and check regularly. Today, we're going to be talking about the events that happened just after the events we spoke of in our sermon Sunday. Specifically, what happens right after Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. So turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. That's Matthew chapter 26, and I'm going to start reading here right after the events of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Starting in verse 47, it says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign, The one I kiss, he's the one, arrest him. So he went right up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Friend, Jesus asked him, Why have you come? Then they came, took hold of Jesus, and arrested him. At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword. He struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. Then Jesus told him, Put your sword back in its place, because all who take up a sword will perish by a sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my Father, and he will provide me at once with more than twelve legions of angels? How, then, would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit, teaching in the temple complex, and you didn't arrest me. But all of this happened so that the prophetic scriptures would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him, and he ran away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you for the gift of your word. I pray, Father, you will be with us as we study, as we invest in our relationship with you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you will speak for your servants who are listening. And Father, I pray that you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. So let's paint the picture here. Let's set the stage, if you will. See, it's in the middle of the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has been in prayer and in great anguish, such great anguish that he was sweating drops of blood. Peter, James, and John had been sleeping. He asked them to stay awake with him while he prayed, but they were unable to do so. Jesus had just woke them up. Because as it says in Matthew 26, 45, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now, there might have been others in the garden. It was just before one of the major pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And many commentators say that, especially in outlying parts away from the temple, there were probably people camping in pretty much every single open spot that they could find. So maybe there really was kind of a crowd there in the Garden of Gethsemane. But who else would be awake at this time of night? And why does Matthew refer to, Jesus, to Judas specifically as one of the twelve? Well, I think this really just highlights the level of betrayal that's coming up here. This is one of Christ's chosen ones who is getting ready to betray his master. Never think that you are too close to Jesus to fall. The reality is, all of us are capable. This man heard all of Jesus' teachings, not only the public ones, but the private ones as well. He walked with Christ. He walked with Christ for over three years. And yet still, he fell. But Judas didn't come alone. The scripture tells us there was a large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And I tell you, this is really significant. The Jews absolutely hated Roman rule. 
for many reasons. One of the reasons that they truly hated Roman rule was because if the Romans found something that they objected to, they would come in mass and they would come in violence to put down that rebellion. And this is something that the Jews absolutely hated. So here we have a mob of people with clubs, weapons of the common man, and even swords, weapons of the authority figures of the day. And they come and descend upon Jesus. It really makes it kind of a double whammy for Jesus and the disciples. It's bad enough that they're here to arrest Jesus. They're here to arrest him, and he hasn't done anything wrong. But it's even worse, because not only are they here to arrest him, but they go about it just like the Romans mistreat the Jews. And how did Jesus, how, how did he greet Judas? Friend. What an amazing word, friend. It's, it's not a word that you would greet a stranger with. It's a word for someone who you are close to, for a companion. Do you think the heavens were watching at that moment? I mean, I, I really don't know. I, I've read some on how the heavens are, are going to look when we get there, and I'm left with more questions than answers. But if the heavens were watching, if the angels were all lined up looking down upon Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he greets Judas as his friend, they must have just been cheering. I tell you, they must have applauded at that greeting because Jesus is basically saying, Look, Judas, I haven't changed. You're the one who is changing. But the door to grace is still open to you. Then Jesus asks Judas a question. He asks, why have you come? This phrase in the original Greek is really a very difficult one to translate. Um, there is no easy translation to this. And in the um, King James Version and the Holman version, which I was just reading, translate this as a question. Why have you come? But the NIV translates this as more of a statement. But either way, basically, Jesus is telling Judas, okay, do what you came to do. And then something really interesting happens. Remember, this method of confronting a problem was a common tactic for the Romans, and the Jews were honestly tired of it. And someone in Jesus's party the book of John in chapter 18 says it was Peter, and I'll be honest, I can believe that because this sounds like something Peter might do. He drew his sword and promptly cut off one of the ears of one of the members of the mob. First of all, Peter proves that he is a fisherman and not a fighter. I really doubt he was aiming for the ear. But it's amazing to me how Jesus responds to this. He does two things. The first thing he does is he reaches down. He picks up that ear off the ground or wherever it had fallen. And he puts it back on. This is really astounding. I mean, maybe not to the disciples. I mean, after all, again, they have been with him for th over three years. They have seen him heal countless people. They have even seen him bring people back from the dead. But what about the mob? Remember, Judas had to identify Jesus to the mob. And back in biblical times, Jesus was probably about as close in the Jewish society as anybody gets to being a celebrity. Many knew him on sight. Almost everyone knew of him and had heard of things that he had done. But these people didn't know him by sight because they needed Judas to identify him. What does that tell me? Well, maybe they hadn't heard his teachings before. You know, maybe they were thinking, here we are, we're out in a mob, and we're simply going to arrest another rebel who has been making false claims. And then he reaches down and puts someone's ear back on. Maybe his claims aren't so false. Maybe they even start to ask themselves, are we doing the right thing here? But the second way Jesus responds is he gives what's called a categorical imperative. Now, that's a big snazzy phrase there that basically says it's an unconditional moral obligation. It's a statement that is true no matter what the circumstances are. And this categorical imperative simply is all who take up the sword will perish by 
the sword. Now, some have taken this passage as an instruction for Christians to be pacifists. I, I don't agree with that personally. But I will say this. I think what Jesus is telling us is even when situations arise where violence is necessary, violence begets more violence. And Jesus' task was not a violent task. He would die a violent death. But his goal was forgiveness. Then Jesus logically points out, look, if you really, if I really wanted to be rescued, if that was really the goal here, Peter, I could simply call out and six legions of angels would come and would rescue me. Now, a Roman legion is comprised of 6,000 soldiers. So if you take that passage literally, Jesus is basically saying, I could just say a word and over 72,000 angels would come and would rescue me. Now, I don't think that's a literal statement. I don't literally think there were 72,000 angels in there waiting for a word to come rescue Jesus. But what I think Jesus was saying is, I have access to more than enough power to rescue me from any situation. Really, when I think about this, I think back to 2 Kings chapter 6. And back in 2 Kings chapter 6, you have Elisha. Elisha and his servant have been camping out on a plane and, and, and as the morning comes and the servant climbs out of the tent in order to prepare things to get about the day he looks around and finds they are surrounded by an army not only an army of soldiers but with horses and even with chariots there is absolutely no escape they are surrounded and what does he do he sticks his head back in and tells his master hey Elisha we got a problem here because we're surrounded. And how does Elisha calmly reply? He says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And let me tell you, this really wasn't a question of counting. Because that servant could very easily say, now Elisha, I count one, two. There are a lot more than that out there. This wasn't a question of counting. This is a question of faith. And when we make a stand for Jesus, whenever we do anything with kingdom significance, we're going to encounter resistance. And when we encounter that resistance, we must remember those that are with us are far greater than those that are with them. Jesus is really saying, look, Peter, if I want that kind of help, I have it at my fingertips. But that's not what's really going on here. Why is this happening this way? So that Jesus can fulfill the prophecies made about him. Jesus then addresses the mob. First, he kind of fusses at them. He's like, look, I haven't been hiding. I have been teaching in the temple complex. You could have come and arrested me there any time you want to. But now you're coming to me in the middle of the night with weapons as if I'm some sort of dangerous criminal. But again, he points out not only to the mob, but I also think he's talking to Peter. And he's talking to the disciples. And he's talking to us. When he says, but all this has happened so that the prophetic scriptures would be fulfilled. You see, everything that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane was for a reason. And that brings me so much peace. I don't begin to understand the reasons of why God does things the way he does. Many times I'm very confused. And this coronavirus is no different. I don't understand what God is up to. But let me tell you, here's what I know. No matter what the CDC says, no matter what our government says, no matter what the World Health Organization says, God has a plan. God is still in control, and God is still on his throne. For I believe that nothing has ever happened, nothing is happening, and nothing ever will happen that doesn't happen because God either promotes it or permits it. He either allows it 
or he makes it happen. And that tells me beyond any doubt, God has a plan. God was totally in control of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is totally in control of what is currently happening here in Columbia, Alabama, in the wiregrass, and even in the entire world. And that gives me so much peace. It gives me a peace that makes no worldly sense. Or as the Bible puts it, a peace that passes all understanding. And you too can have that peace. It's as easy as accepting a free gift. You see, there's only one thing that can separate us from God, and that's sin. And the whole world has a sin problem, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you see, God is love, and he wants nothing more than for his creation, us, mankind, to be reunited with him into that perfect relationship that we're designed for. But it can't happen if sin still has hold in our lives. So Christ, Jesus Christ on the cross, was God's plan for redemption. For when we accept that free gift of forgiveness that Christ went to the cross to purchase for us, not only does he take away our sin, but he replaces our sin with his righteousness. And when that happens... Then we are in right relationship with God. Then we get the benefit of the gift of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within us. We get that still, small voice that speaks to us in times of distress, that speaks to us in times of joy. And our joys are doubled and our fears are cut in half simply because we are never, ever alone. So if you're sitting there and, and there's some fear in your life, if you're nervous about how things are happening in this world today, my human eyes, I see it and I understand it. But let me tell you, my heart declares with one loud voice, Jesus is the answer to any fear or unrest. Place your faith, your trust, and your hope in him. If we can help you in any way, please let me know. You can send us an email at prayer at ebenezercolumbia.com or give us a call here at the church office or you can call me. Anything we can do to help you out, that's exactly what we want to do. Because let me tell you, we are all better together. We can tackle anything this life and this world throws our way because we are children of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and again, just thank you so much for the peace that passes all understanding. Help us, Lord, to dwell in your peace in everything that we do. And help us, Lord, help us to be shining examples of your love and grace in this dark world that we live in. We love you, and we thank you, Father. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Y'all have a blessed day.